This will be our final lecture of the course, Ideology and Politics. The lecture today is going to be on Friedrich Nietzsche, Zarathustra, Hermann Hesse, Magister Ludi, Thomas Hardy, Far from the Madding Crowd, and the subtitle is going to be called Sources of the Self, uh, drawn from Charles Taylor's uh, great tome. Uh, two important works by Charles Taylor that all of you, if you continue in your work in political philosophy or political science, important to read uh, Taylor's Sources of the Self and then his The Secular Age. Both books are very nuanced and intricate examinations of the rise and the complex understanding of the self and then of secularism itself, how it emerged and its implications for the sacred secular debates in public life. Uh, I'm also been doing social sources of the self because I have I've had you watch the century of the self, the, particularly the four videos on the centuries of the self. And so a significant element of the liberal tradition has been an attempt to examine, to understand the self. What is the self? Is the self something that uh, we born, we, we live through a period of time, we die? So short duration, is it the clothes we wear? Or is it the job we have? Is it the appearance we have? Um, all these transient things that come and go. Is it an image we project? Is, have you seen the centuries of the self? How the, the media uh, attempts to shape desires, uh, to direct what we should be restless for, long for, and then it defines the self. Uh, what is this thing called the self, the I? And so this liberalism has attempted in its various ways to elevate the self, the autonomy of the self, the importance of the individual using their liberty as they see fit. But then what is that self? And in that process, what are we to be free from? And what are we to be free for? And if we can't decide, as Friedrich Nietzsche once said, tell me what you want to be free from or the cage you want to be out of. And tell me what you want to be free for, and I'll tell you if you're just changing cages. Uh, and so the question of the I in its quest for meaning and purpose is really foundational to the liberal tradition. So I'm going to linger a little bit. Again, this is just going to be a portal into Friedrich Nietzsche using Zarathustra. I'm going to briefly compare him with Hermann Hesse, Magister Ludi from the Glass Bead Game, and then conclude with Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd. Each of them are explorations of the self, what defines the self, the poorest self in one way, the buffered self in another sense. Uh, because humans and ideology, it is about a search for meaning, a search for purpose, what leads to, to a meaningful, a substantive life, what leads to a silly, a superficial life, what leads a person to be constantly restless because the things they turn to for meaning do not fulfill, what are the things that people turn to that are substantive and they dive much deeper? Now, Frederick Nietzsche is very, very important in all of this because the latter part of the course, we've been looking at the century of the self, the sources of the self, uh, and it's usually inframed within the liberal tradition of the rights of the individual using their liberty, all being equal to choose what they think is the good, the meaningful, and we are all equal in that choice. Now, Friedrich Nietzsche is one of the great critics of significant elements of the liberal modern tradition and what it, he sees as the, di the dimming, the demeaning, the thinning out, the trivializing of the self, the lowering of standards in terms of overcoming those standards and living at a much more significant and substantive level. Um, Zarathustra is one of his key books, but before I move a little further along, there's often two ways of interpreting Nietzsche. There is the right of center read, read of Frederick Nietzsche, largely delivered through his sister as he became a plaything of the Nazi regime, remembering Nietzsche was a German, lived in the 19th century. And significant elements of Zarathustra and other texts certainly can give a person the sense that, oh, I see this can feed into uh, Nazi uh, tradition, in particular his emphasis on the warrior, warring, facing suffering, 
uh, overcoming suffering, not feeling pity for yourself when things are difficult or when you've been victimized by life's uh, uh, slings and arrows in that sense. Uh, uh, and, and so in Nietzsche, you get the tragic side of life, the painful side of life, but not allowing uh, these difficult circumstances that come our way uh, in any way to weaken the resolve of the will or the overcoming of painful uh, situations and circumstances or liabilities or contexts we're born into. And so you get the emphasis on the overcomer, the aristocrat of the soul, uh, who's not going to allow their past, their temperament, their situations to be things which the whole emphasis on pity me, life has treated me so bad, why have I been born into this context, this body? No, the overcoming, the warrior, uh, the one who engages the tragedies, the suffering of life through a strong will, that very much can feed into a right of center perspective of which, of course, elements of, and of course, is drawing from tradition, particularly an element of the Greek tradition, the tragic tradition. And so if he starts with the issue of suffering and tragedy, and of course, what had happened to the Germans after World War I and Versailles was that we have been the victimized, we've been mistreated by these uh, victorious powers. And so one, uh, one way of dealing with the sense of being victimized, uh, being victimized is just to roll over and basically say there's nothing can be done. Uh, we've been mistreated except passively what's happened to us. The other is, uh, yes, look at what's happened, but we're going to overcome the way other people have seen us. We're going to stand strong and powerful once again and we will stand up against any sort of opposition. And so you can see how the right of center with the notion of the will and strength and the warrior and overcoming suffering and tragedy and misunderstanding and victimization and not using those as an excuse to be passive and to roll over can play into the right. The liberal left has also turned to Nietzsche and looked at his, particularly say book one in Thus Spake Zarathustra, where he deconstructs all sorts of social institutions and, and what are often seen as reliable forms of what it means to be human. So, for example, education. He's blistering in his critique, for example, of education as technique, or even education in the humanities, in which professors with their immaculate perceptions, they're like skeletons. They live in books. Uh, they don't engage the real world and, and live passionately and meaningfully in a full and full bodied sense. Very critical of education that most people say, see as very significant in their process of finding their way in life. Very critical of religion in many ways, uh, in, in the way it can demean, it can shrink, it can make people passive and not engage the large issues. A very wary of, say, friendships and how. Uh, how the adder can get into friendships and a friendship which can begin very, very well can almost people can turn on one another in the terms of manipulating, demanding, using one another to serve their interest. The neighbor, uh, he's very, very wary of what seems to be an idyllic view of neighbor and neighborhood and how neighbors can take advantage and misuse one another. Um, friendships and relationships. Uh, He's, he, he's very suspicious of what are seen as important formal institutions of civilization and being civilized and fitting into society and how there can be a worm, there can be a snake and all of that, or a beast and all of that. Now, where does that thinking come from? Uh, so first of all, to recognize that Nietzsche can be read on the right, Nietzsche can be read on the left. Ronnie Biner's book, Dangerous Minds, look at how uh, if you read Nietzsche on the right, you can go in certain directions. Obviously, there's many people on the deconstructionist, late modern, postmodern left who Nietzsche is very much their guru and mentor in terms of not trusting anything, being cynical of all institutions which promise to deliver meaning. Uh, but in fact, a great hurt and harm and dis disappointment can come from commitments to those things. Now, where would Nietzsche get some of these ideas from, particularly his concern with the with the, the, the dark side, the shadow, the demon in people? Well, remembering Nietzsche grew up a 19th century German. His father was a Lutheran pastor. And certainly within the Lutheran tradition and elements of the Roman Catholic tradition, there is this notion coming either from original sin or total depravity, 
and that in particular Luther's work, for example, The Bondage of the Will, uh, that humans can um, and are enabled um, to live the fullest, the best life without the impartation of divine grace. And so because of sin and because of the impotence of the will, uh, humans then within a Lutheran and elements of the Catholic tradition uh, become passive recipients of grace. And so will itself within a certain read of it in any way uh, lacks the ability to overcome uh, the weaknesses of human nature, the limitations of human nature, the bitterness can creep into human nature, the aspirations of human nature. And it is this bondage of the will that Luther, that Nietzsche would have grown up in. Uh, and in his whole emphasis on the will, uh, he's very much critiquing a whole element of the Roman Catholic and Lutheran tradition in which the will is in bondage in many ways. And so he's arguing for the assertion of the will, people using their will and their strength and their abilities to live a meaningful and a, and a full life. And it is this, and in that sense, um, not using in any way um, difficult uh, situations in life as excuses to lay down uh, and say, uh, life is difficult, I can't move on in life. Um, circumstances have weighed me down it's either family or the time i live in or a relationship and I constantly i'm the victim i'm the loser i'm the one who doesn't make it uh, and the cynicism and skepticism that can emerge from that he always saw skepticism and cynicism as part of a weak-willed person who needs to overcome that or as he would say bury that in the grave or that's something you pass by and move on in life uh, those are the marks of an indulgent, uh, narcissistic human being who does not want to live meaningfully in a full way. Uh, and so uh, for Nietzsche, Nietzsche, he doesn't fit easily into the politics of the right or the left in terms of politics. A couple of his uh, sections in Thus Spake Zarathustra, for example, he sees the marketplace, whether it's the consumer uh, who's always trying to find one product after another that if consumed and had, they will find meaning or something. He sees these as flies in the marketplace or the corporate person, the one who produces the goods that sells them in, in, in the hope that others will um, cannibal-like consume them for meaning to fill up their own interior emptiness. For them, he, these are just flies in the marketplace who don't want to live meaningfully other than just consuming the newest little thing that's at the market in any in any moment of time for meaning. Also in politics, he in one of his sections, he looks as particularly the final book four in Zarathustra, he looks at the kings who come up to the cave where he is. And of course, the cave comes from the Platonic tradition. The mountain, again, the mountain is the whole issue of one has to exert and overcome insecurity, weariness, the temptation to give up in the midst of life struggles, but you continue up the mountain. I have spent some time at Nietzsche's home in Sils Maria in the Engadine Valley and, of course, the Swiss Alps, which are just back of his home. And you, it's very easy to see how he picks up these images of overcoming uh, when the storms of life come in, when the winds are hard. The tendency is to cut down, go into the forest where it's safe and predictable and secure. His argument that if you want to make it to the mountain, you, in fact, have to get through the winds and the tempests and the storms of, of time. Uh, his concern with politics, as I mentioned, particularly the section on the two kings and the ass, is that you have the one king in politics who represents the political right, other the political left, and they themselves have gone through a period of time in which they cease to believe in politics anymore. Uh, and so you can see in, in, in um, Nietzsche, when he gets to politics, and another one, uh, particularly those political zealots that we can see today very much uh, before us. Again, the victimization when, when injustice has occurred, often then people rebel very, very strongly against, uh, against that, legitimately so. But then what happens when you get very intense political zealots that are willing to use violence? Uh, Nietzsche compares this to one of his sections, Feuerhund, which is a, ger a German word for um, fire dogs. They just breathe out fire uh, against those who oppose them. And Nietzsche was very concerned with that type of zealot political thinker that breathes fire against anyone who da dares to question them. So uh, Zarathustra uh, and uh, Nietzsche, one thing to note here, even though Nietzsche seems to be critiquing the modern world, 
He's very, very much via Zarathustra, the lone individual who distrusts most things, uh, any of the major social institutions that seem to be agents of transformation or means of, of living a deeper, more common communal life. He sees them all as shot through with a worm. Uh, and so be very, very careful of being too committed to these types of things. So you get the lone individual. One of the images is this lone tree up on the mountain, and the roots only find their way through rocks. And again, this is into the suffering, the struggling, and it stands against the tempest of time. So in Nietzsche, you get, and, and of course, this is just a primer, but in Nietzsche, the idea of the lone struggling individual against opposition against people who can't be trusted, institutions who can't be trusted, organizations that can't be trusted, because they're all shot through without him saying it uh, with uh, original sin. There is a dark side, there is a beast, there is a manipulative side in everyone, so be very, very careful. And that includes in Zarathustra himself, uh, Zarathustra himself. So it is this individual who's very critical of the bourgeois, the entrepreneurial self, the middle class self, which again is compromised. And like the Frankfurt School itself said, be wary of capitalism uh, in that it, it mollifies. It, it's a drug uh, that uh, uh, gives people a sense that if they just have this product or that product or they've consumed they can assume this particular product, they're going to be happy, they're going to be fulfilled, and, and people just go from one product to another, mesmerized by the newest little gadget on the stage at any given time. Now, in Herman Hesse, because Herman Hesse was very much shaped and interested in uh, Frederick Nietzsche, because Nietzsche was a, a significant thinker that brought uh, because of his critiques of where Europe was going and elements of what he saw as the, the dimming, the deme uh, demeaning of what it meant to be human, uh, the last man, as he called it, that only wanted essentially their bread and circuses, uh, their personal peace and security, and uh, there was nothing greater or grander in their thinking. Uh, Hermann Hesse was very interested in what Nietzsche was doing in books like his, for example, Damien, Steppenwolf, which he explores on the one hand, the longing in people for personal peace and security and predictability. Uh, on the other hand, the Steppenwolf, we get actually the music group Steppenwolf draws from, from Nietzsche, who, who lives in the steppes, who's the wild animal, the risk taper, the unpredictable person, the brutal side. Uh, and so you have these two sides in people um, that are pulled to and fro. And so Hesse explores these issues in Steppenwolf. Uh, and again, he's t dealing with the individual and the complex nature of the individual life as he was in Damien himself. But as Hesse matured in his thinking, he came to see that the lone individual who was only about asserting, uh, bringing into being creatively, and through the use of their will, their own meaning, their own happiness, was, it, was itself um, short-circuiting actually the, the, the meaning for happiness and fulfillment and purpose. Uh, because the question is, what is meant to be overcome in a person in their search for meaning? Um, and so for someone like Hesse, uh, where you have the inflated ego or the aggressive self, a searching for meaning against lesser uh, lesser areas to turn to, uh, Hesse would argue, in fact, it is only in the overcoming of that ego itself that a person finds meaning. So the question always is, what is to be overcome? And in the overcoming, uh, what is the direction that is to be taken? And so in Herman Hesse, uh, moving forward from, say, the, um, after the the lone individual, you get canoped or wandering uh, to some degree in Siddhartha. The movement is to books like, say, um, Narcissus and Goldman, where, where Narcissus, interesting exploration of Narcissus, because in Greek thought, Narcissus is the person who's always looking at themselves in the mirror because of their insecurity. They don't know who they are. They're constantly having to have a reflection back uh, that there is some sense of worth or meaning. But in Narcissus and Goldman, um, again, you get Goldman exploring all sorts of lower, lower desires, sensual desires, sexual desires, uh, artistic desires, but there's no uh, solid core within Goldman. Uh, and Narcissus is committed to the life of the community, in this case of the monastery, and what it means to be an abbot in a community and to care for people. 
uh, in that sense. So you're beginning to get the movement in Hesse to the question, the real overcomer is the one who knows how to serve community. There's two Greek words uh, that can be applied in this. One is a political understanding of service. The other is an interpersonal understanding of service. So for Hesse, the real overcomer or the Ubermensch in that sense versus the bourgeois mensch or the Untermensch, the one who lives uh, with animal or, or physical instincts, is the one who overcomes one who overcomes the will to power in which others others in that sense are often um, the stumbling blocks or the obstacles one has to move in, including the inner self to find meaning for Hesse as he moves forward uh, in his in his thinking uh, Narcissus and Goldman of course in Siddhartha you get the service Narcissus and Goldman Abbot, he's he's a shepherd, a shepherd for the larger community, and then in Journey to the East, uh, Leo, who's the head of the league, is one who serves this growing number of spiritual circuits, uh, searchers. The great work, though, the glass bead game of Magister Ludi, again is a situation. Magister Ludi is Joseph Connect. Connect is a word that means service in German. He's the one who serves the Castalians. Uh, he's there over a long period of time, the training that goes into uh, being leadership. So in Hesse, the notion of the true self or the meaningful self is one who is integrated, knit together in the context of a community of people who are searching for the highest and most meaningful good in the context of serving one another and, and not seeing the other as the potential problem. So to some degree for Nietzsche, like Jean-Paul Sartre, um, other people are hell. Uh, for Hesse, more or less, other people can be the means of one's own transformation if seen from a certain, a certain perspective. And so in Hermann Hesse, as he grapples with Nietzsche and particularly the attempt to understand what is the self, what is the layered nature of the self, what is the nature of the indulgent, the egoistic self, and what is the what what is the nature of the journey into the true self or the true face that is? So it's in the interaction between Hermann Hesse, Magister Ludi, and certainly in Nietzsche, Zarathustra, we get very different understandings of the self. Ob obviously probed in a much more meaningful way than the film you would have watched on Century of the Self, in which the the media and the entrepreneurial uh, industry sells images of the self, and if consumed. Um, then some sort of temporary meaning is going to be achieved. Thomas Hardy's a great book, Far From the Matting Crowd, and we'll be watching that film uh, to end this course. It's an interesting exploration of, of the platonic understanding of the self. And Far From the Matting Crowd, obviously the title says a great deal, the importance to get away from the madding crowd, the busyness, the franticness, the drivenness of the city in which people are just really victims of not only their cultural drivenness, but their own internal drivenness, their inability to be still, to be silent. And again, what is the self beyond the busyness, the franticness, the drivenness? Far from the madding crowd, is it moves out of the city, uh, Dorset, England, uh, but it's the study of uh, Bathsheba uh, Everdeen. Of course, as soon as you hear Bathsheba, you're right into the Old Testament story of David and Bathsheba um, and the lust that took took place there, a very sensual. So what do you get in Bathsheba is already, of course, David was the real problem. But what Hardy is doing, he's looking at the nature of human longing, human longing for meaning. And Bathsheba is a woman, again, in search for meaning. Uh, can be, Bathsheba is also the human soul, the psyche in that sense. and it's a study of where she turns to in the quest for meaning. And there are three options that Bathsheba can turn to and much of Far From the Madding Crowd explores. And it's very much a platonic interpretation of the, the directions a person can turn to in the search for meaning and how if they go to the wrong place is the betrayal, the disappointments that people can live with. Uh, so the key is to get the direction properly for the soul. And if that isn't taken place, then of course, then, of course, the painful nature of the human journey as a person uh, goes from one thing to another and the constant sense of, well, I've tried this, I've tried that in the merry-go-round of life and nothing seems to fulfill my restless heart, as Augustine would say.
So Bathsheba's first choice is Sergeant Troy. I guess if you hear the word Troy, we're into the Trojan War. Sergeant Troy is very, very much the high adrenaline type, the adventurer, um, the person who is, is full of energy and excitement and war and battle. And one cannot help but get the sense when you're dealing with Sergeant Troy uh, that if a person is passive in any way or relatively empty within and looking for meaning, this is the person that's going to fill the tank, fill the tank temporarily. Uh, so Bathsheba's first commitment in any meaningful way is to Sergeant Troy, only to discover these sort of intense energetic temperaments also can be very unstable. And there's often uh, an anger deep within certain people like that as they're driven from one thing to another in the search to fulfill a, 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 deep, a deep emptiness. Um, and so Sergeant Troy represents very much the sensual, the physical, the war, the intensity. Uh, but underneath it is a great instability. And of course, when she begins to press him more, they do get married. Um, and she's warned against that by Gabriel Oak, who, of course, proposed to her earlier. And he represents Gabriel Oak Shepherd, represents the stable, uh, the higher um, objects worth turning to in the quest for meaning. But she's too young at that point, too immature, too naive to understand what holds the soul together and leads to a quiet mind in a meaningful way. So because of her bad decision with Sar uh, Sergeant Troy uh, and the disappointments, and he begins to turn on her, uh, blaming her for all the problems, and you get then this bullyish temperament that when it does not get what it wants, it then turns on the other person, and she becomes the victim of his anger, his bitterness, his brutality, and she realizes she has to leave uh, leave that or she's only going to do her own soul and life great hurt and harm. Now the alternate to that lower level, what Plato would call Thumos, the energetic, the intense personality, which is very unstable in many ways, but people are often drawn to because of the energy, the high adrenaline, the excitement uh, that seems to bring to people, uh, was former uh, the farmer Baldwin, who's the one who offers a predictability, the estate, the nice home, um, the profitable, secure uh, way of life. And Boldwood is the, very much the bourgeois farmer who's brought success to the fields, to the cities, an upstanding citizen. And so he brings her predictability. He, he brings her a large house. He brings her security because she's lost her way uh, as a result of naively being committed to Sergeant Troy and then her, him turning on her, demeaning her, and making her feel very insecure as if she's the reason for his problems, where in fact he's not willing to take responsibility for his own uh, actions and his own attitudes. He keeps projecting blame on Bathsheba for all the problems. And, and the more she stands up to him, of course, the more violent and more angry he becomes. So Farmer Boldwood is the opposite of that. Uh, he's one who's a gentle, a caring soul who offers his, her a place of, of refuge, of rest, of predictability, of quietness, of support, which is the alternate um, to Sergeant Troy. But she also sees that uh, in a context like that, that also much would be missing because there's more to Bathsheba Everdeen than just the long to have a large house, uh, a good farm, um, to be a, a, a citizen who just fits in without asking any more meaningful and difficult questions about life, and that and that uh, material possessions will satisfy her at the end end of the day. And she knows her longing and hunger is is much more for more than just material possessions in a big house and estate and property and wealth. You know, that can't fulfill the human heart. So the person who begins far from the madding crowd is is a shepherd. And it's Gabriel Oak. And of course Gabriel Gabriel is angel in that sense, um, within the oak, solid oak tree. Shepherd is one who cares for the sheep. Uh, in that sense, Gabrielle Oak is a shepherd of being. And throughout most of Far From the Madding Crowd, she, in one sense, deep down, she knows he's, he is the person 
uh, that she should be turning to, but she constantly turns to other options, checking them out, see if they work, only to discover at the end of the day she's restless, she's not fulfilled. And the, as, as far from the madding crowd comes to an end, what Hardy is proposing of three, these three levels of where a person can turn to in the search for the self, do people want to turn to the Sergeant Troys, who on the one level seem to be attractive, they're compelling, there seems to be energy, uh, they're, they're very, very much dynamic personalities, but underneath when probed, uh, there's a beast at times, and when they're challenged, when they're threatened, they can come out all things, all, all things turning on those who question them at a deep level. And there's a, a, a bitterness, a brutality, a bully-like side to the Sergeant Troys. Uh, and of course, Bathsheba Everdeen has to leave that. And as Plato understood very clearly, be wary of those type of people and be wary of asking, uh, why would I be drawn to that type of, what, what, what's the draw and what's the naivety in the draw? The other, as I mentioned, is the, the farmer bold one, who's the bourgeois, the predictable one, but there's also um, a, a, a lack of depth involved in his, his interest is just providing basic, basic needs and some wants for life. But beyond that, there's, there's a, lack of, um, a, a, a lack of thinking deeper, living in a more meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Interestingly, in, in Far From the Madding Crowd, there's a, a clash between Boldwood and uh, Sergeant uh, Troy. Uh, Boldwood ends up shooting Troy. And so those two elements, as it were, are canceled out in Far From the Madding Crowd. And in that sense, uh, Hardy is pointing to the nature of the true self is to find those shepherds of being in life. And this is where you go back to Paideia as education. Those people who bring together like Gabriel, the eternity and time. They're as steady as oaks in the midst of the storms of life, but quite different from the tree of Nietzsche. Um, they're shepherds of being. So they're shepherds who understand the complex nature of communities, the sheep and uh, anyone who's had to be a shepherd, I was once asked to be a shepherd many years ago. And anyone who works with sheep knows that they're very fickle and unpredictable, erratic. And a shepherd has to know how to work with very, very different temperaments to hold them together, often against the threats of wolves or, or cougars, many other animals that threaten them. But they can panic very, very easily. And so Gabriel Oak is one who brings together what it means to be a shepherd uh, in that sense, there's a depth to Gabriel Oak you don't even get in Magister Ludi, uh, because Magister Ludi is working with very sophisticated intellectuals, the Castalians. Um, Gabriel Oak is working with um, people from all ages and stages and temperaments of life, like sheep itself. Uh, he brings together eternity and time in doing so, but he's as steady as an oak tree. And so three understandings of sources of the self, uh, Nietzsche's Zarathustra, Herman Hesse's Magister Ludi, and Hardy and Far From the Madding Crowd, Gabriel Oak, and how Bathsheba Everdeen is very much every one of us and the directions we can turn to in the search for meaning and purpose. And if we get it wrong, there's implications in doing so. And so in that sense, Nietzsche, Hesse, and Hardy take us far beyond the film I had the four parts of had you see in the century century of the self and take you to, to directions in which when we ask questions about the self whose version of the self should we explore and why and where does where does uh, Nietzsche's understand what's the weakness the blind spots of that how does Magister Ludi correct it and then then since how does Gabriel Oak the shepherd uh, bring even much greater depth to these questions as the journey ever goes on to understand in a more substantive and meaningful way the nature of the self.